you. Thank you very much, uh, Samuel, for, uh, for the great introduction. And it's um, a great pleasure and privilege uh, to, uh, to present uh, to in this uh, forum and to this audience. Um, and uh, thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to do so. Uh, let me uh, just um, uh, share my screen. Um, I wanted to offer um, a few thoughts about uh, the economic case for food safety capacity building. Um, uh, I know the audience um, are distinguished uh, food regulators and there is really no need to make um, uh, kind of to highlight the importance for food safety capacity building. However, when, um, when we speak to, um, to policymakers and to uh, government officials, to, to the ministers um, and other um, partners who, who actually design uh, the policies or provide funding for policies, sometimes it is useful to think in a structured way for making the economic case for uh, food safety capacity building. So allow me to, uh, to really, uh, focus on that and um, uh, kind of uh, present uh, the importance from the economic development um, uh, point of view. So traditionally, um, uh, many people think that food safety is something that happens in the labs, and that's kind of the traditional image of, of food safety. However, when we really look in depth, we actually find that food safety has foundational basis to many of the sustainable development goals. And it's, it's important for achieving the top three um, uh, sustainable development goals, uh, no poverty, zero hunger, and good health and well-being. And it is also very important from the Gender, gender and equality point of view, clean water and sanitation, decent work um, and economic growth and sustainable cities. So in a way, um, food safety is a, is a critical element for achieving uh, sustainable development goals. When we talk about food safety and actually when policymakers, when many people talk about food safety, they see the tip of the iceberg. They, uh, they see that food safety impacts trade, um, uh, food safety uh, costs uh, farms um, uh, some money, uh, but they, because basically policymakers look at the food safety from the trade perspective, which we call tip of the iceberg. Uh, but then if we look at the whole story, we also see that consumers get affected significantly. That uh, there are, uh, in, in many countries, we see fragmented regulatory frameworks, and we see that foodborne diseases place a heavy toll on, on the populations, especially on the poor, poor people. Um, recent studies um, uh, by WHO, have shown that food safety um, has as much burden on public health, um, which could be compared to key public health risks such as AIDS, HIV, tuberculosis, and malaria. Um, and from the commercial point of view, we see that the global trade exacerbates food safety. Um, problems. Urbanization, for instance, in, in this slide, we see that our urbanization uh, changes the way we consume food. This is, of course, an example from Asia, but I think it is very also relevant for, for Middle East and North Africa, and certainly quite relevant uh, to Egypt, where I'm uh, presenting this presentation from high and rapid um, urbanization and also young population drive the tastes and preferences of consumers and we see significant shifts from traditional uh, kind of diets 
to more modern diets, which include, you know, prepared foods, which include um, uh, more oil and fat, more, more um, protein-based diets. Um, and that also changes the way the food safety problems um, um, are apparent. Um, we, we also see and that with the expansion of food exports, we also see high dependence on food imports. For instance, in, in Asia, we see growth and, of food exports, but we also see in, in this region, in Middle East of Africa and North Africa, um, and also especially in the Gulf uh, region, heavy reliance on food imports, which which creates commercial imperative for maintaining trade standards and, and improved um, uh, trade surveillance for food safety. Um, of course, the middle class, the growth of the middle class, um, and especially in the emerging economies, creates a sustained demand for food and for more food that also kind of um, exacerbates the situation for, um, uh, for um, uh, food safety control as, as imports rise, as well as domestic production rises. So uh, foodborne illnesses um, affect uh, at four levels. Um, at the consumer level, we see cost of illness and treatment. Um, uh, food avoidance and higher prices of, for, for safer food. Sometimes people perceive organic food safer and they pay higher prices and people uh, perceive farm-grown food and you know, they pay higher prices. So really hi higher costs on the consumers from the health perspective, but also from the perspective that because of the lack of information, they have to pay um, higher prices and uh, to, to, to get food that they perceive is safe. safe. Um, unsafe food also has impacts the farms or food producers or food processors because it in, increases the costs um, uh, from the lost sales, lower prices that they pay, as well as the fines and consignment rejections that they incur because of the um, uh, because of they are unable to meet standards, because they are unable to meet the regulatory um, requirements, as well as because they need to throw away the food if it is perceived to be unsafe. Um, and from the overall um, economy perspective, public health costs, tourism issues, and overall loss of productivity can significantly affect the economy as a whole um, if, if we face unsafe food. Um, globally, um, uh, the estimated annual loss for unsafe food is about $110 billion. And we see that many countries um, in this graph represent the region. I, I can see, um, of course, Egypt, um, Iran, um, and other countries of the region that really are, uh, are at the top of, of the loss um, uh, when it comes to, uh, to um, uh, food safety illnesses. And, and this is a uh, more kind of summarized uh, picture um, after African continent and um, Southeast Asian um, uh, region um, Eastern Mediterranean region, region as classified by WHO, is the third um, that suffers from foodborne illnesses. And, um, they can be as high as 570, um, 570 persons per 100,000. Um, so uh, per 100,000 population. So uh, when we revisit the iceberg, we, we basically saw not only the trade-related costs that, um, that affect uh, the economy because of unsafe food, 
we see domestic costs for unsafe food. And that basically brings us to the imperative of food safety capacity building, needing to regulate and build capacity, not only for trade, but also for the domestic regulation, for the domestic capacity building for safe food. And there are three uh, dimensions um, that we basically want to work in order to create uh, this capacity. Um, eliminating domestic cost, cost avoidance, creating, uh, improving food market performance and improving international competitiveness. And that's basically the economic case uh, for food safety capacity building. Here, I would like to bring a case study, an example of how the World Bank approaches uh, food safety capacity building. And here I am bringing an example of, um, uh, of the work that we did in Vietnam a couple of years ago. Um, we focused on food safety risk assessment, and we looked at the um, providing uh, options and policy rec recommendations to the government of Vietnam for strengthening food safety risk assessment, risk analysis, and risk mitigation capacity. So that was at the, fresh, uh, at the turning point, point for Vietnam when Vietnam adopted new food safety legislation and wanted to improve the regulatory acts in order to um, uh, harmonize them with more modern, or more scientifically based, uh, risk-based food, sa food safety regulatory framework. Together with the counterparts, we analyzed the institutional and policy framework for food safety and provided policy recommendations based on the international best practices. Our report is available online, but key areas of the report where we where we did in-depth analytical assessments focused on the value chains, identifying food safety risks in value chains. We uh, identified and categorized food safety risks, and we used the survey evidence to uh, make the case to the policymakers for improved capacity building, for more risk-based regulatory framework, and for improved policy implementation at the ground level. Uh, I will stop here and I will turn to my colleague, Anna Christina, who will talk about the World Bank's approach to One Health. And I thank you very much for your attention. Over.